Good morning. It's great to see you today. I, I know today is Mother's Day, and for some people, this is the day you've been waiting for all year. And how many are glad it didn't snow today? Because <laughs> I've seen that happen, and there are no happy mothers when it snows on Mother's Day. Um, but for all you moms, uh, so grateful for all that you do to make your family what it is. And of course, some of us, uh, there's some tension with our moms, or maybe our moms have passed, or maybe there's some in the room who would very much like to be moms, and that hasn't happened yet. And so what we want to say to all of you is that there's still reason to hope, there's still reason to pray, there's still reason to celebrate a day like today. Wow, that sounds like a hallmark. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. We're in, we're in a series uh, in Galatians, and what we've been talking about is this whole year is how can we thrive? And so we spent several weeks in the book of Proverbs because when we have access to God's wisdom, we thrive. And then we, we talked about being emotionally and spiritually healthy because when we're emotionally and spiritually healthy, we thrive. And now we're talking about freedom because when we have freedom, we, we thrive. And we're looking at a letter that Paul wrote. Paul was an apostle. He planted a lot of churches, and he's writing a letter to one of these churches in Galatia. And this is what he says, beginning in verse 13. By the way, in, in case you're wondering, if you're looking at uh, the New International Version today, I've actually switched the text to the New Living Translation today, and you might ask why, and the answer is because. How's that? Okay. Uh, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. After that, I, uh, after that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was uh, what people were saying. The one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Um, I think a lot of us depend on certain formulas in life to make life work. There's just some things you have to do at the right time, in the right way, in the right order, and then it works. For example, baking. I was at a graduation party yesterday, and there were some people who brought in some baked goods, and everything I tested was, was great. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm a thorough tester, and sometimes I'll go back and test again just to be double sure. You know how that is. Uh, but you have to, the oven has to be at the right temperature. You have to add the ingredients at the right time. You, you have to mix it. Sometimes you have to set things aside for a little while and you put it in the oven. It, it's a formula. And, and there's lots of things in our life that work by, by, by a way of formula. But the simple truth is, is that when it comes to our faith, we wish it was a formula. Just say these words in these orders, do these steps, and then you're in. You're good. But the challenge is, is that freedom is never a formula. Do these things and you're free. Freedom always comes with a story. Every person who's experienced freedom at any level of their lives, they have a story to share about that. And Paul, he begins to talk about his story. And, and so today we're going to look at what the evidence is of grace. How do you know if grace has really impacted your life? And you might say, because I prayed this prayer, and then I went to this place, and then I did these things, and so I'm in. And, and Paul wants us to know there are actually ways you can tell if grace has entered your life. 
And we want to take a look at that today. So the first evidence is everyone has a life before grace. Everyone has a life before grace. This is what he said. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion. How many have a story of, you know what I used to be like? Anybody? Yeah, there's a few of you, and there's more of you, and I've heard some of those stories. <laughs> he said he violently persecuted God's church. Paul, by birth, was Jewish, and he had a remarkable education. Uh, back in those days, their education system looked quite different from ours. And, and so basically, you would apply not to a university, but to a person. And, and he, he hit the jackpot. One of the best-known educators in the ancient world was a man by the name of Gamaliel. And Paul learned from him. Like, he, this is the best education you could possibly get. And in fact, uh, not only was he well-educated, he was... He was very passionate. He was very zealous. He was, he was ambitious. He, he was, he was uh, competitive. Like if you were in his class, he was going to get a better grade than you. That's who he was. And this is his life before Christ. He has this, this life that he used to be, but he also acknowledges he persecuted the church. But why did he do that? And he did that because he was passionate about something that he thought gave him license to do that. Passion and ambition can actually be wonderful things, but not when they're used to hurt people. So the second evidence is that grace puts Jesus at the center of our lives. Before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. This is fascinating. Paul is not making a move to elevate his position in God's kingdom. Actually, Paul is being moved by the maker of all things. So in our world, this is not how things usually happen. If you just, let's say you want a job or you want to enter a certain college or university, I'll just stay home and wait for them to come to me. That, that you will live in your parents' basement for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, that's not how it works. Before I was born, God chose me. He called me. Something is happening. And this is fascinating, that even before I ever did anything, before I, before I was born, I don't think, I've talked to people who say they have memories of being in their mother's womb. I don't know, it could be. Uh, none of them seemed upset about it, so uh, that's good. But, but this is what I know. In your mother's womb, you don't have a lot of decision-making capacity. You don't make any choices. You're not sitting in your mother's womb thinking, I think engineering would be a good option for me. You don't get to choose your parents. And that's a good thing, because some of us would have chose differently. God's attention is on us. When others are ignoring us, when others are mistreating us, when others are doubting us, when others are misunderstanding us, when others are abandoning us, God's attention is on us. So much of our, our lives are about trying to get someone's attention. And what I want you to know, before you ever did a thing, before you breathed your first breath, before you cried your first cry, before you did anything in your life that was noteworthy or admirable, God's full attention was on you. Is there anybody in this room that thinks that's a really good thing? Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. His attention is on us. So th this is what he says. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me. God has to reveal Jesus. This is a fascinating uh, passage, actually, because there's one other place in the New Testament where language like this is used. It's, it's that, that probably Peter's best moment. 
And uh, he's, he's with Jesus and the other disciples. And, and Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter blurts it out. He says, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. My father revealed this to you. This, in, in fact, in the original language here, that concept of flesh and blood, no man, no flesh and blood revealed this to you. God revealed who Jesus was to Paul. And only God can do that. And all Paul could say was thank you. Gratitude flows out of his heart because he didn't earn it. He didn't accomplish it. He didn't achieve it. So many people look at their spiritual journeys and their faith lives as though something that they accomplished. There, I read through the Bible. There, I prayed for an hour all at the same time. There, I went to so many services without missing an attendance. There, I served in some capacity. And we assume that we're, we're elevating. We're, we're, we're increasing our education. We got out of kindergarten and now we're in first grade, second grade, third grade. Now we're in post-grad. We, we assume we're achieving something. And it's not how it is. Because when we are achieving something, we are at the center of our lives. And God is in the peripheral. But when God reveals to us who Jesus is, he is at the center of our lives. And we might do something for him because we want to be, express our gratitude to him. But that's not the same thing as doing something for him so he will notice us, value us, and appreciate us. In our world, I know there are lots of people who spend their entire lives trying to prove something to other people or get approved by other people. And that's because there's something in our nature, in our culture, that tells us we're not worth much on our own. And God completely disagrees. All he could say was, thank you. Jesus is at the center of his life. The third evidence is time alone with God. This is what he says. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia and later, I return to the city of Damascus. Our culture teaches us that we have to gain our own value. And our culture teaches us that freedom comes from, from the things that we do. We accomplish it. And Paul came to understand that once Jesus became the center of his life, it was Christ who made him free. But it also meant this. He had a whole lifetime of seeing things a certain way, of seeing God's word a certain way, of seeing people a certain way. When he looked at scripture, he did not see Jesus in scripture. What he saw was a club that he could use to bludgeon people into better behavior. And he was very good at wielding that club. He was a ninja at using scripture to try to bludgeon people into some kind of compliance. And so Paul also saw people as often problems. If they were not living the life that they were supposed to live, he thought it was his job to fix them. I'm going to give you a big pass today. Are you ready? Here you go. It's not your job to fix anybody. I'll just say, if God can't do it, do you really think you can? How powerful do you think you are? Why is this important? Because when we spend time in the presence of God, we actually begin to see Scripture differently. Some of you, when you look at Scripture, what you see is a harsh and an angry God who's just looking for an excuse to dump wrath out on you or someone else. And that's our natural inclination if we haven't spent time with God. Some of us, when we get in rooms like this, we, we feel guilty when we walk in. Some of us, when we see other people, we see problems and we see obstacles and we see speed bumps and, and we see people that, that can create a lot of difficulty and complications in our life. And, and that's how we see people when we haven't spent time in the presence of God. But when you send, spend time in the presence of God, you actually begin to see people a little bit differently. You see scripture differently. It's not as though the interpretation has changed. Your, your perspective, your paradigm has changed. 
And then you see how gracious and how good God is and how, how much he is doing to reconcile the entire world unto himself. So when you are alone, by the way, uh, some, some of us don't like to be alone. Some of us have to have the music up loud and, and, and we've got to be involved in something. I mean, some people have been even known to mow the lawn rather than just sit in silence. And why, why is that? Here's what I want you to know. You will not achieve peace by, your, by volume, by sound, or by actions. We achieve peace, we experience peace when we're in the presence of the Prince of Peace. That's where peace is. And so it's, it's really interesting to me that, that when we gather in rooms like this, the question I would have for you is, do you have any thoughts about God? Do you access any of his word? Do you have anything to say to him outside of rooms like this? Because if this is the only time that you think about him, if this is the only time that you ask the scriptures, if this is the only time that you might utter a prayer, then this is good. Like we want to be in community. Scripture calls for that. But if our, our faith is only something that happens when we're surrounded by other people who are calling the shots, maybe, maybe grace hasn't invaded your heart yet. And I know what you're thinking. What do I need to do? No, no, no. Who do you need to be with? And it's Jesus. So take time. Uh, last evidence, the fourth evidence is sharing your story. Three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter and I stayed. I want you to just remember that word stayed. It's an important word with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. The word stayed in, um, in the Greek language is called his, it's historio. It's a word we get history from. And it's, it's what people do when they spend time with each other. I'll ask the worship team to come out. And uh, they, they stayed. You, sh you start sharing your history. Um, perhaps some of you have been on a, a dating site or you have a dating app and you put in information about yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, almost everybody likes uh, walks on the beach and, <laughs> and good music and puppies or cats and and uh, you don't know anything about anybody like that. Uh, do you know how you get to know people? Is you get together and you start sharing stories. <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, I did this. I can't believe I did it. And, and sometimes there's laughter. Sometimes there's big eyes and go, you're kidding me. You, you did that. And you talk about the vacations you went on, the time you were ill or hurt, and what happened in your family. Why do we do that? Why do we tell those stories? Why is that important? Because that's revealing who you are. So Peter and Paul, they got together and, and they his, historioed. They, they stayed. Peter asked Paul, so how did Jesus become the center of your life? And Paul would ask Peter, so how did Jesus become the center of your life? And, and those are very different stories. Peter could say, I was fishing. And Jesus walked up to me and he gave me an invitation to follow him. And I didn't think I was worth any of that, but he assured me. It was all good. And for the next three and a half years, I listened to him preach in public. I listened to his private conversations. I watched him pray. He corrected me sometimes. One time he called me the devil. He said, get behind me, Satan. That's... But he is the center of my life. And Paul, how, how did you get to know Jesus? How did Jesus become the center of your life? And Paul says, well, I, I was actually trying to kill people like you. And I was on my horse, on my way to Damascus, and, and God knocked me off my horse. There are no two conversion stories that are the same. 
because there are no two people who are the same. It's not a formula. God doesn't call you to come and say these words this way and then take these actions and, and now you're in. It's not how grace works. Grace has a story attached to it and your story is different from somebody else's story and your story is no worse than somebody else's and it's no better than somebody else's. The stories are different, but the grace is the same. Is there anybody that's happy about that this morning? The grace of God is the same. It's the same. So we get together and we share our stories I'm wondering if you have a story of how Christ became the center of your life. And maybe you don't. And that's okay. I'm not asking if you've been raised in, in church all your life, because some of us have and some of us have not. What fascinates me is, is our stories tend to go one of two ways. Lots of stories in, in our faith journey are about the people who lived rebelliously. They, they struggled with addictions. They had great fears and anxieties. They, they, they just were, they lived selfishly. That was not Paul's story. Paul's story was, I was raised in the faith my whole life. I was passionate about it. If you didn't line up, I'd try to get rid of you. And some of us, we think we don't have a story because we were raised in religious environments. It's not true. Jesus can still become the center of our lives. So what's in your story? What's in your story? And, and we, we have some good stories to tell. I love telling stories. I really love telling stories where I'm the hero. I just... But there's stories where I'm not the hero at all. Where my character wasn't strong enough, where my faith wasn't big enough, where, where I was intimidated. I was trying too hard to get other people's approval. And I am so glad that the grace of God doesn't just flow into the times I got it right, but it flows into the times that I couldn't get it right. And here's what the thing. All of that is part of our story. Paul started the passage, right? You know what I was like when I used to live according to the Jewish traditions. What were you like before? What's changed? Would you bow your heads? Uh, Father, I ask today that you would help us not just try to earn our freedom or enter a formula where we think we've gotten a correct answer. I'm asking today that you would help us see who Jesus really is so that he becomes the center of our lives and, and then we're not controlled or manipulated by the other forces that either we generate or other people do in our lives. Our lives begin to orbit around you. And I ask that you would give us a story to tell because it is your grace that has made us free. It's your attention upon us that has changed our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, let's all stand together.